Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be reading True Home Invasion Horror Stories. I hope you enjoy them. But before we get into these stories, I want to thank the sponsor of today's video, Treats. Treats is a subscription service treats box that gets sent to your door every month. Treats is amazing. They've been on this channel multiple times in the past, and they sent me another box from somewhere around the world for us to enjoy today. So we're going to open it up here. I've never opened this before. All I did was kind of cut the tape on the bottom. Let's go ahead and uh, open this up and see where this is from. So you get the little flag there with every box that you get. I am not good with country flags. So we're going to go ahead and open this up here. We got the little postcard here. This is from Poland. So it gives you a little information about Poland and things of that nature. Let's go ahead and open up this box. So you get some more things. You get to see what all treats are in your box and some more information about Poland there. This is what I love about treats because it's not only yummy, yummy snacks, but it's also a glimpse into other people's culture. And then here is a look at the inside of the box with all of the yummy treats that are inside of there. See if I can get it in frame there. All of the yummy treats that are inside of there. I love treats so much. This company is absolutely amazing. So today we are going to try Danusia. It looks like some sort of chocolate and I'm a chocolate fiend. So let's go ahead and open this up. Oh, it looks like it's like a, a dark chocolate. Love me some dark chocolate. Let's go ahead and give this a taste. Mmm. It's got fudge in there. It's dark chocolate on the outside with fudge on the inside. It is so good. So good. But yeah. I love treats so much. This company is so amazing. They've supported the channel for a long time. And uh, I definitely hope that they continue to do so because I love this company. I love working with them. They're such a joy to work with. If you want some treats, if you want to try some treats from around the world, make sure that you go to the link that's in the description down below. It is an affiliate link and it helps the channel out if you do order a treats box through that link. Also, make sure that you use the coupon code ENTERSCAREASLEEP, all one word, at checkout to get 15% off of your first treats box order. So again, go to the link in the description down below and use code inner scare sleep at checkout to get 15% off your first order. So thank you so much to treats for sponsoring this video. It really does mean the most. And thank you to you guys for watching. And now without further ado, lay back, relax and enjoy these true scary stories. I also want to mention and thank I am Grim for reading the first story in this video. Make sure that you go to the link in the description down below to check out his channel and hear more from him. So now on with the video. When I was nine, I was down the street at my best friend's house. Her mum was sick, blackout drunk, in bed completely non-responsive. Before she went to bed, she had told us to make sure that we didn't answer the door under any circumstances. Easy can do. We went upstairs to play Barbies or whatever. About two hours later, there's a knock at the door, and then another, and then a louder knocking starts, and then it stops. We go back to playing until the back door opens and there are footsteps into the living room. She tells me her dad won't get off work until late that night, so it can't be him. 
Her mother has passed out in bed. What do we do? My friend is really freaked out at this point. We are two nine-year-old girls and she whispers, My dad has got a Glock in the closet. Bingo. To be fair, I had parents that took me to the gun range for about a year at that point and I did riflery at camp every summer. But obviously this was dumb. We found the gun, loaded it and crept downstairs to defend ourselves against the home invader. At this point you might be wondering, could they have called the police? Yes. We were lost in the source, caught up in the moment, and it all happened very fast. I turned the corner with the gun feeling like one of Charlie's angels ready to shoot the invader and literally kill someone if they came for me, only to find her grandmother there making a sandwich. Her grandmother was planning on coming over, but my friend's mum in her drunken state had completely forgotten. I guess this is not a real home invasion, but nine-year-old me was ready to shoot, so I'd say it's close enough. When it comes to fight or flight, I learned that I'm a freeze person. When someone broke into my home, my instinct was to call 911, which I tried to do with the guys right in front of me. So naturally, the one knocked the phone from my hand. That was my final thought. Then I just started screaming while I was just standing there. The one guy must have been panicked too, because he grabbed a large kitchen knife and started doing this dance. He was lunging towards me with it, but then jumping back. I guess he couldn't decide whether or not to shut me up, whether or not he wanted to harm me to that degree. I wasn't having any thoughts, so it didn't occur to me to even attempt to move. I just stood there and continued with my screaming. I was screaming loud enough for tenants four floors up to hear me. By the time some of the tenants reached me, the guys had fled. I have since experienced other emergency situations, and I freeze every bloody time. This was close to 10 years ago, living in bed study with four friends. The building next door was being renovated, so there was always a lot going on outside, and we were a bit of a party house at the time, so there were always plenty of people over and we were also friends with a decent amount of folks in the neighborhood. One of my roommates sold weed and mushrooms at the time and had a bad habit of telling any new acquaintance he made. One day I was home with only one other roommate and I hear the doorbell ring while my roommate is in the shower. I go to check the door and out the small window I see a guy in a hard hat and safety vest with a badge around his neck. I crack the door, but not the gate and he says he's here to talk about the building next door. So I decide to open the door. I guess I looked away for a second as I opened the door because the next thing I knew, I was face to face with two dudes in ski masks with pistols against my chest. We had a Husky at the time who decided that this was a good time to play with the new people in the house. And my first instinct was just to beg them not to hurt her. They pushed me into the front room and down onto a couch and demanded the drugs. I played dumb for a second but knew that I was crap out of luck, so I directed them to the bedroom. The dudes passed by tens of thousands of dollars worth of instruments, electronics, camera gear, and they didn't touch a thing. They did go through each bedroom and take any visible weapons that they could find. It was only a few pocket knives. They asked where the rest of the drugs were where the harder stuff was, and I explained the kid they were robbing was a hippie who didn't mess with the stuff. The guys said that they were our friendly neighborhood watch, complimented the dog, and told me that we should make a documentary about what happened.
I was about seven, staying at my grandmother's house over the summer in the 80s. Three guys broke in in the middle of the day while I was there alone. I was already in the farthest bedroom watching TV, so when I heard them break in, I hid under the bed and got really quiet. They walked through the house, talking and searching everywhere. One of them knelt and looked under the bed, and we locked eyes. He had a Halloween-type mask on, and then he stood up and said that nothing was under the bed. They walked around the inside of the house for another 20 minutes and then left. I stayed under the bed until my grandma got home from work many hours later. I was too young to know if they took anything or not. Both the TVs in the house were the huge ones from the 70s that are in like a wooden box. So they required like 10 guys to move them. We were sitting around in my friend's kitchen, getting stoned and watching Wimbledon. Someone climbed in the open window of one of the bedrooms. It was a ground floor flat and lightly looted the room. He then stepped into the hallway and froze because he realized that six 20 something men were sat staring at him down the hall. What followed was a very tense and garbled conversation about how he was the landlord's son and we needed to let him out immediately. We knew that it was bullcrap, but between being high and having no idea what exactly to do with a burglar now trapped inside with you, we just let him out. He'd made a sort of vague hand gesture slash posture, implying that he might have a knife on him, and we figured it wasn't worth getting stabbed over. Hadn't yet thought to check if he had stolen anything. We then sat debating for 10 minutes on whether or not to call the police, because we had several ounces of weed with us, and the whole flat reeked of it. The decision was made for us because a neighbor had seen the guy climbing in the window and called the cops, who picked him up as he left, then came and knocked on the door to speak to us. One tense conversation later, and the few things that he had picked up were returned to us. No mention was made of the fact that the place smelled like a Grateful Dead green room, and we resumed our afternoon, deciding that a pint was now in order. We went out and ended up having a ridiculous night that generated other memorable stories that we still bring up 15 years later. All in a very strange, hazy memory. But I'm glad that it ended up being a basically non-event. Because it could easily have gone a lot worse. My roommate's ex-boyfriend, methed out of his brain, kicked in our front door and hit me in the face with a concrete tamper. Think a giant potato smasher. I'm a pacifist, so I subdued him by bear mauling him until he was on the ground and able for my roommate to lay on him. I called the cops. My roommate wanted me to kick or hit or dismantle him in some way, and I couldn't because I loathe violence. So he got up to get his, and the guy got away. I called the cops. They came and took our statements, ID, etc. And so, when they came back in saying that I had to go with them, my face streaming blood and dazed, lifting me out of my seat to get handcuffed, it was a weird moment. Seemed like I had a warrant for a Dodge ticket or something that I don't remember. But I had only been sober about three months, so I figured stuff like this was going to start happening just sucked that you know, I was now two run-ins behind on calling the cops as the guy who cut me up was gone not under pursuit and I was going to jail I'm intake they all assumed I was resisting a rest book because I was sitting there bleeding cuts on my face and the bridge of my nose common injuries in that situation when I told my story I got way better treatment as everyone was like dang this is a great example of why people are afraid to call us. All in all, not my worst incarceration and not my best evening of hanging out in my living room.
I was 15. It was almost midnight. We lived in a one-story ranch. I heard some tapping, and then sounds like someone trying to open my locked bedroom window. The blinds were closed and I wasn't about to look. I army crawled out of the room in the dark, then quickly ran across the house to my parents' room. I woke my dad and told him that I think someone is trying to break in through my window. Found out that night that my dad kept a Glock under the mattress. He went out the front door and quietly around back to my window, gun drawn, to find a girl who had a crush on me, trying to wake me up to sneak in. For clarity, this was the 90s. I did not have a cell phone. I was semi-woken up to my bedroom lights being turned on. Before I could do anything but set up and mutter, huh? I took the butt end of a sawed-off shotgun to the face, cracked my head open just above my eyebrow, and as head wounds do, blood started rushing down my face and into my eye. I got my stuff together pretty quickly, look up and see three guys in ski masks. They grabbed me by the head, dumped me out of bed and on the floor, and beat the crap out of me for what felt like multiple minutes. Probably closer to around 20 seconds, though. After that, they ask where everything is. I start pointing out what I had. Some weed, mushrooms, cash, and all of my computer and electronic stuff. But they didn't like what was presented, so they turned my entire room upside down. Homie has the shotgun barrel to the back of my head the whole time. I thought for sure that I was dying then and there at 17 years old. They finish up. Tell me if they call the cops, they'll be right back as they clearly know where I live and dart out the house. I jump up and pull the blinds and look out the window just in time to catch taillights and nothing else. That was the night that I determined that I'd messed around and found out. One, someone always wants it more than you. And two, some of them give absolutely zero craps what's required and or the potential consequences surrounding getting it. In this case, we're talking 20 plus year federal bids for the laundry list of crimes that were committed. I couldn't sleep properly for the next roughly eight weeks. First, four were the worst. Waking up screaming in cold sweats. People in neighboring units building I moved to directly after this, closing their doors or walking loudly, meant that I had to turn on all the lights and sit for an hour before going back to bed. All sorts of stuff. Probably should have seen a professional, but I didn't. Good life lesson. And it gassed me up to produce the resume and accomplishments that I have now. I went to bed alone and fell asleep, but something woke me up about after a half an hour. I wasn't fully awake or thinking, but I had a vague idea that a noise from outside had woken me up, so I went out in my underwear to see what it was. I opened an outside door, and total surprise, right there, there were three people trying to force open a window. Well, I woke up pretty rapidly and tried to shut the door but they rushed at me and it was on. All three had masks and one pointed a pistol at me. I just knew that I couldn't let them get me back in the house. So I barreled out the doorway with one guy on either side of me shouting to my neighbors for help. We struggled for a while like that and I tried to keep moving and the pistol guy racked the gun and made to shoot but didn't for whatever reason. Eventually they all took off and I gave chase and they hopped the fence and in doing so dropped the gun in the weeds. I grabbed some rocks and started pelting them as they tried to find it. They found it and ran off, never to be found. I still regret not reacting quicker to get that dropped gun, but the adrenaline was pumping and I was wild. The next day, I found a live round that had been ejected when the guy racked the pistol, so there was one in the chamber. 
Looking back, my choice of action was risky, but it avoided my being at their mercy inside the house where they could have done whatever at their leisure. I found out my neighbors were useless buttholes as no one did a thing to help and I consequently moved away shortly afterwards. One time in college, I accidentally smoked way too much and had to have my roommate come pick me up and my car. Not drinking, didn't think I'd smoke. She walked over and drove me home. As we pulled up to our house, we saw who we thought was my roommate, who was a very slender young woman with short hair. The silhouette looked like her. We go to the back door, by the driveway, where we'd always enter, and it was chained shut weird considering that at least two of the four girls who lived here weren't home so we go to the front door which is unlocked also weird we always kept the front door locked by the time we came in through the front all the lights were off which was not how it was when we approached the house we turned the lights on and find not the slender short-haired roommate but our extremely drunk basically unconscious fourth roommate on the couch Slender roommate, nowhere to be found, even though we, quote unquote, just saw her. Even though I'm high as heck, the girl who drove me home insisted that we move the half comatose roommate. I then go downstairs to my basement. Only I had a room down there to wash my face. I'm still paranoid and very high. While I'm taking my contacts out, I hear someone in the adjacent laundry room open that door sprint up the basement steps, unchain the back door and bolt. I called the cops. Canine unit confirmed the scent, which dropped off in the woods. Sadly, no answers. The cherry on top was that the slender roommate came home from wherever to a living room full of cops. She was also super high. I would not recommend walking into a home invasion while high as a kite. My one-year-old had gotten absolutely covered in mud and applesauce at the park. So when we got home, I took him straight upstairs. My husband had called to tell me that he'd be home a little early. So I left the door unlocked behind me, as I knew that he was only a couple of minutes behind. Sure enough, as I was putting my baby into the tub, I heard the front door open, close, and lock. I called down that kiddo had gotten my hair dirty, so I was going to wash up as well. Silence. Then I heard the doorknob jiggle, followed by pounding on the front door, shouting and my phone ringing, along with the back door opening and slamming shut. I set my naked baby on the floor and ran downstairs to undo the security lock at the top of the front door to let my husband in before running back. My husband had been only seconds behind the guy who had walked through the unlocked door. That guy had enough time to do up all the locks, realize his mistake, and then run away out the back door. My husband handed me a pistol, and we went through and cleared every room to be sure. He took point as I had our baby in a carrier on my back. He was arrested a couple of days later. A neighbor's daughters had taken their trucks to go pick up lumber, while the dad's sons and son-in-law broke ground on a new shed. What the home invader saw was the trucks, usually driven by the dad and the youngest son, leave. He attacked the woman, expecting an empty house, only to discover four large men immediately come running when they heard a crash. He'd stopped her from screaming. He attempted to claim insanity, but was sentenced to six years for the assault. The only other thing that comes close is when a cat brought a baby rabbit in through the dog door at 2 a.m. I went from dead asleep to screaming threats like a banshee and swinging a walking stick as I chased the screams. It was dark, and this dark shape was moving on the stairs to the main floor, so I did a forward dive roll down 14 stairs to land like a crab over it, still holding the stick, still screaming. 
I was very confused to be faced with a cat and a baby bunny, both of which froze in terror. I was confused enough that I let them run away. I then spent the next hour trying to get them out of the house. No, I'm not a gymnast. And no, I couldn't do that stunt on a flight of stairs again if I tried. I was 14 or so and homesick from school alone. I was taking a break from playing Smash Bros on the Wii when I heard something in my dad's bedroom. I looked in the room and saw someone with a bandana covering their face going through his drawers. So I grabbed a big kitchen knife and decided to confront him because I lived in a small trailer home and he was likely to find me before the police showed up. I can't quite explain the inescapable feeling of dread and fear but also excitement that gripped me in that moment. I decided to confront him. I gathered myself and decided to yell, what the heck are you doing? But I'm certain that I sounded rather frightened. But the guy spun around, and it was obvious that I scared the crap out of him. I could see that he had a gun tucked into the front of his pants, and the moment I saw it, I felt like it lasted five minutes, and I felt another tremendous wave of fear overcome me and freeze me but the guy never reached for it. And I could tell that he saw me gripping the knife and was probably frightened and thought that I was gonna stab him and he forgot about the gun. He took off the bandana and yelled, chill, it's Trevor dude, chill. Turned out, my neighbor across the street and his drug dealing friend decided to rob my house. I yelled at him to get out and he sprinted out. And that's when I saw his friend who was still outside hop on my bike and race off. I was fairly afraid of these guys prior because they used to get high on stuff like K2 Spice and sometimes get violent or destructive and I didn't want them to get angry with me. Because of this fear, I felt too afraid to report them to the police because I was afraid of any revenge action. A couple of weeks later and Trevor wound up dying of an overdose, not sure on what drug, and because he used to be fairly popular at the high school. There was a huge school and community gathering for his funeral. Reflecting on it now, I realize that it is quite sad. This kid's life ended early due to the destructive effects of drugs, and I should have felt sorrow for the loss of life. But at the time, I felt angry that his life was being celebrated, and everyone was sharing how much they loved and missed him. For me, he was the guy that made me feel unsafe and insecure, even when I'm in my own home and I resented him for it. I've also since developed severe anxiety, and I had home invasion nightmares for a few years after the incident. It's been probably about 12 years since the incident, and a lot of my anxiety and paranoia that I had developed, along with some other PTSD issues from a period of military service, was resolved after an experience with psilocybin mushrooms. One life tragically ended by dangerous drugs, and one life saved by a wonder drug. I lived in a basement on a corner lot. One day I parked in front of my house door at 11 p.m. with my headlights pointing across the other street. I see a guy in a white sweatshirt making odd motions. I realized he's using a whip. I continue to watch and he turns, stares in my direction, and eventually walks across the street and stands 15 feet from my car and stares at me. I call my roommate who's inside and tell him what's happening. I'm a jokester, so my roommate buddy doesn't believe what I'm describing. The creeper walks towards the back of my car, under a tree and I lost sight of him. I tell my buddy this and he comes out our door, closing it behind him glances at the creeper under the tree and pretended to rummage through his own car parked in a side parking lot with the creeper in between us. At this point, my buddy thinks this might be a friend of mine and I'm winding him up. The guy with the whip reappeared from under the tree, now all in black and runs to our door. The creeper, with a police-style belt, whip over his shoulder, looks in the window next to the basement door and opens it and runs in. I fill with adrenaline and call my buddy back while still sitting in my car. 
I tell him the guy just ran into our house. He yells at me for still sitting in my car and to come with him as he runs to our now open door. I'm worried about our weapons, his whip, and the randomness of all of this, and call 911 as we enter. He goes first and I stay near the door. I don't want any part of this. He finds the guy in the back corner of our 900 square foot place, setting in our recliner. He claimed to be meeting someone in our place. My friend's mom had owned the house for 10 years, and it was a professional building with basement storage before we moved in. We kick the guy out of our house. As I continue to speak to 911 outside, I flag down a passing sheriff car. By this time, the whip guy has crossed the street and climbed a neighbor's house. The neighbors happen to be coming out, oblivious to the person on their roof. As we tell them what's happening, the deputy now standing, listening. We hear the guy, on the roof, crack his whip. The guy got away, leaving his white sweatshirt under the tree. This was in my early 20s. We were in a house we had just moved into the previous day, owned by my dad's cousin in a nice neighborhood, literally around the corner from our old house. My dad was a night owl, up watching TV and I was asleep. I heard the crashing, and then a guy with a gun, tactical gear, and a ski mask was in my room yelling that he was police, and I needed to get up and go into the living room. I was only sleeping in my t-shirt and underwear, so I grabbed sweatpants from the floor, and the guy was telling me to come on, and I was still half asleep, thinking they were really cops, and of course, a cop would let me put on pants, so I just put on the pants anyway. There were two more guys, dressed the same. They tied our hands together behind our backs. I hadn't realized that they weren't cops, and made us lie down on the floor, all while the one guy was yelling that there were drugs. Where are the guns? Like, what the heck? My dad was having trouble breathing, and I kept telling them to turn him over he was going to die. So they did, which made me think that maybe they didn't want to kill us. I told them how he was just a hard-working guy, trying to take care of his daughters after his wife had died. I talked about my nephews, my job working with kids. I don't know. I just kept blabbing, I suppose in an attempt to humanize ourselves so that maybe they would let us live. I saw them taking my computer, one of those old iMacs maybe worth $50 by then, a few hundred in cash that we had, a small TV, and then they left. My dad had gotten himself free and ran out the door to see if he could see their car, but they were already gone. He untied me, and I was mainly worried if my cat had gotten out, but he was hiding under the couch. We called the cops. They came and took our statements, but we never heard anything. We thought maybe the robbers were looking for whoever lived there before us, but the little bits and bobs that they left behind seemed to indicate a normal family. I think the dad was a preacher of some sort. Not the kinds of people who you would think would be stashing guns and drugs. But then, once our panic had settled, we figured it had to have been the movers. We'd hired these guys to help move the heavy stuff, just off one of those two men in a truck flyers or something. And I remembered one of them was there when I spotted a shell from my dad's old hunting rifle. He didn't even have any more when we were cleaning out the closet. And also there was our roommate, my dad's best friend from high school, who rented my sister's old room and smoked a lot of pot. I guess the movers saw the shotgun shell smelled the pot and figured that there was more where that came from. The other reason that I think it was them was that there were two white guys with Russian accents and one black American guy and only one of the robbers spoke and he sounded like a black American guy. It would make sense that the other two wouldn't want to talk since their accents would give them away. We never told the cops that we thought it was them though because we didn't want to get in trouble for the pot. We just moved again right after having moved in. Just didn't hire movers that time. Anyway, it was really scary. I'm still a really light sleeper, 20 plus years later.
I lived out in the country at the time. At 3 a.m., I was wakened by the sound of a car pulling up in front of my house. Then I heard the engine turn off. I very quietly made my way to the front door, which has an opaque window. I looked out and could see two flashlights moving around. Very stealthily, I went back to my room and grabbed my semi-auto 12-gauge off the wall mounted gun rack. I flicked the safety off as quietly as I could, and I made my way to the front door. By this time, one of the guys was in the process of jimmying my door open, with a flashlight in between his legs pointing up at his face, which was a very creepy look. He didn't see me as I quickly opened the door, with my shotgun pointing in his face, asking very grimly, can I help you with something? His whole body spasmed, and he ran around the side of the house, yelling and warning his partner, with me on his butt the whole time, saying, you better run. When I rounded the side of his house, I saw his buddy, starting to take off in their jeep, with the passenger side door open, into which jumped the guy that I'd been chasing. They went the wrong way, heading deeper into my property. I headed them off, knowing there was only one out. When they turned around, they were going about 70 miles per hour on a gravel road, just about out of control. I trained the gun on them as they drove past, but didn't fire. I was going to shoot out their tires, but feared a legal disaster. When the dust settled, I realized his buddy had been in the process of robbing my SUV. He had everything neatly stacked in the back, but only managed to get away with an old first-generation iPod. An elderly friend who was staying with me at the time said she never heard anything until I yelled at the guy and gave chase. Not too surprisingly, they left behind a meth pipe. This wasn't the old incident that I had living out there, but I've never been closer to taking a man's head from his shoulders. I'm very grateful that I didn't have to. I don't like to think about what might have happened if I hadn't woken up, or worse, if my elderly friend had been home alone. I used to work nights. The day in question, I had probably gone to sleep around 5 a.m. Around 8 a.m., I woke up to my doorbell dinging rapidly and someone beating on my door. I looked out the peephole, and there were a couple of guys that I didn't recognize. There was a pickup truck in the street, kind of positioned weird in front of my house. Like, not properly parked, just weird. I got a bad vibe from the situation, so I grabbed my pistol and just kept quiet by the door. I watched out the peephole for a few minutes, as they knocked less but stayed there. They tried to look in a window as well. They were probably at my front entry door for about five minutes. I never let on that I was home. One went around the corner and tried to open the gate to my backyard. I had a padlock on it. He ended up climbing over the gate. I ran to the back of the house, where the sliding glass doors were to see this guy about to put his pry bar under the door to lift it off the tracks and get in. I got right up by the door and had my gun about a foot away from his face and screamed, get out of my yard. He looked up and I swear his eyes popped out of his head. The message was well received. He got out of my yard. He was yelling something in Spanish as he climbed back over my gate. His colleague also got out of my yard pretty quickly. I called the police and told them what had happened. An officer came out and had to look around. He asked that if they found the guys if I thought that I could identify them. Honestly, I couldn't, so I told him no. The cop told me that had I shot this guy, they probably wouldn't even have to take me downtown because he was posing an immediate threat. I guess that's fine and all, but I truly don't want to shoot someone unless it's to save my life or someone else's. Clearly showing the gun and screaming was enough. A lot of people that I've told the story to over the years have insisted that they would have shot. It's really kind of sad. The fact that I didn't shoot and they left proves that it wasn't necessary. This happened in 2006. I didn't have any security cameras or anything. I also didn't sleep well for a, quite a while after this.
This happened to me about a month ago. I was working from home, alone, which I don't normally do. I was on a work call and I saw that some packages had been delivered, but since I was on a call, I didn't get them. They had been there for about an hour, and I guess the guys who were scouting my house took that as a sign that no one was home. Plus, we hadn't cut our grass in a while, and we had no cars in the driveway. I parked in the garage. At about noon, they cut our power. In our neighborhood, all of the breaker boxes are accessible via the street. When we moved in, we had asked the landlord about getting a lock, and he said that it wasn't allowed. So anyway, first my work call drops, and I figure it's just the Wi-Fi that went out. I thought it would be back soon. So I got up and went to the bathroom, on the way hitting light switches, and I soon realized all the power was out. That wasn't unusual either, since sometimes we do lose power. So I finished up in the bathroom, and I distinctly remember having the thought, what if someone was breaking into the house? I should grab the toilet brush. Who wants to be hit with one of those? But I figured it was an overreaction. The neighborhood is safe, blah, blah, blah. I should mention that I have a pit bull mix, and around this time she crawls under the bed, which isn't all that unusual because that's where she likes to sleep. So I begin to walk down the hallway into the kitchen, to see if the appliances were out too. And as I turn the corner into the kitchen, I see two large grown men wearing hoodies and masks walking into the back room. They had shouldered the door open, even though it was unlocked. At this point, everything becomes a little blurry on the timeline. I don't know if I started screaming first or if they started running first, but this guttural, otherworldly shout came from somewhere. I honestly didn't know how I could make sounds like that. But I just started screaming, get out, get out of my house, and I ran at them. You know how they say that you never know how you'll behave in a crisis situation until you're there? I learned that in a fight or flight situation, I fight. It's possible in that split second that they already started running, which is why my brain told me to chase. I don't know. I don't remember. So me... A short, small, young, unarmed woman charges these two men, each of whom probably weighed twice what I weigh, and they just fled. They sprinted back through the open door, over the six-foot wall, which coincidentally bumps up against the high school and elementary school, during the school day. My hands were shaking so bad that it was hard to lock the door and dial 911. I don't remember what I said. I don't remember when my dog came in on the scene but I do remember trying to speak to the operator between her barks. The cops showed up about seven minutes later, probably because I told them they ran into school property. The cops did a sweep of the house, took a statement and turned my power back on. They got a helicopter to search for them actually, and we weren't the first house that they had done this to. They had tried the neighbor's house a few doors down too, but had been chased off by a chihuahua. So these idiots were just looking for an easy target they hadn't targeted me specifically. All the same, that didn't really help me feel any safer after the fact. It's made it hard to be alone in the house anymore, especially at night. We got a second dog. Asked the landlord for cameras. He hasn't delivered yet. I'm still struggling with how unsettled I feel in my own home now. And as far as I know, they never caught the guys. Like 4 a.m., September 12th or 13th, I was 12 and home alone. I was trying to sleep and I thought that I heard my parents walking in. I got up and silently walked downstairs and looked to see two guys wearing all black, silently and cautiously walking around. My mom taught me gun safety and how to use them, so I went to grab the 9mm pistol in my father's drawer. One problem, though. My parents' room is downstairs, right in front of the intruders. Note that I was 12, short and skinny, so I waited for them to walk into my grandmother's room, and I snuck into my parents' room, grabbed the gun, and walked out, attempting to sneak back to my room. I was scared alone and it was pitch black. 
One of them was walking up the stairs to my room and another towards my parents' room, the room that I was in. I was forced to turn the corner and shoot him. I don't remember much about it, but I think I hit him in his stomach. It was pitch black after all. The other man ran towards his buddy and saw me standing there with a gun, and he ran out the door and left his friend behind driving away in a car. I called the cops and then my parents. They arrested the guy who ran, and the other guy died. I killed someone at 12 years old. It was very traumatic for me and my parents. My father bought me a big can of bear spray, and I actually used it against a coyote attacking one of our chickens. But I needed extreme therapy after that. But everything is good now. Honestly, it was horrifying. I heard my back door open, which is weird, because it absolutely lived locked, because it was noisy and I didn't want to use it. I grabbed my AR and tucked myself into the space between my bed and wall, called the police, saying someone broke into my house. I'd say probably 10 seconds after that, my bedroom door slowly opens. As soon as I could see him, I fired six shots into him. I completely forgot I had even called the police and ended up calling them again on my work phone. Gonna be honest here, I puked quite a bit. I'd rate the experience a solid zero out of 10. What the investigators had found was even more horrifying though. They had found that he had been stalking me for nearly six months, just going by pictures on his phone. He had pictures of me at home, driving down the street, at work, eating out with friends, looking through my windows at night, at my parents' house, more pictures of my nieces who are six and eight. He had a list of addresses that I had gone to, how long I was there, seriously some next level stuff. They found what they called a R-word and abduction kit, a rope, handcuffs and ball gag in his bag. What I've taken from going through that is teaching myself to be more aware of my surroundings. I was 14 and my brother was 12. We were home alone, and my room was right next to his at the time. My door was open and I saw a kid maybe 16 walk past my door at the end of the hall. We made eye contact, and he turned around and walked the other way. I hadn't heard anything weird like grass breaking or someone slamming into the door. Any sounds that you'd typically expect with a B&E situation. So I went to talk to my brother. I asked him if he invited over a friend and he said no. He saw the kid too, and we looked at each other. I closed his door and made him jump out the window and followed him out while I called my mom and then the cops. Our rooms were on the ground floor, about six feet off the ground, so not too high. The kid knew something was up and took off. Cops got there, took our statements, and had us sit in the back of the police car to look for him. We didn't find him that day but they did find him later in the evening. We found out that he'd broken in through the kitchen window above the sink, about eight feet up, and tried to steal a serrated kitchen knife. Dropped it on the way back out that window. The cops never asked for my name, but they did ask for my little brother's. For some reason, his name wasn't blocked out on the report, even though he was a minor, nor was our address. Kid's family found out, and came back a few nights later screaming for little brother and saying that they would kill him. They ripped my ACC unit out of the window, but it didn't unplug from the wall, so it just hung on the side of the house. I'm a very deep sleeper and didn't hear any of this, but did wake up to my mom squatting over me at 3 a.m., trying to pull the unit back inside my bedroom. The squatting was more traumatizing for me than the break-ins. We've since moved. I remember this like it was yesterday. I was around 9 or 10 years old at the time, and I was home alone while my dad went grocery shopping or something. 
I was watching it on the living room floor with minimal lighting. I love scary movies and always tried to set the mood. I thought I heard something coming from the back door, but our storm door was a little loose, so it was common of it swinging and shutting. I will admit this only added to the suspense of watching a killer clown. My father's bedroom was to the left of the living room, if you were facing the TV, and then I spotted it. Something. Someone crawling along the floor. There were two entrances into my dad's room, one from the living room and another that led into the kitchen and where the back door is. The whole time I was just still. I couldn't move. Couldn't think. Didn't know if what I was seeing was real or a figment of my imagination. It was really dark in my dad's room, and the only light was being emitted from the kitchen. But since it had an angle, the shadow overcast completely blocked any vision I would have had to make out facial features and the like. All I saw was this deep black silhouette crawling slowly through my dad's bedroom. Time seemed to just stop, because before I knew it, even though I was watching the entire time, I never even seen the person leave. Not gonna lie, I was terrified. Not of the home intruder, but I thought it was Pennywise coming to kill me. Shortly after, my dad came home and I told him immediately. Long story short, we found out that it was my mom's boyfriend who was on drugs, and he obviously broke in and stole my dad's change jar. Don't do drugs, kids. When I was 14, my mother was a heavy drug addict with a boyfriend who was also addicted. They had an on again, off again relationship and this night they were fighting on the phone. I sat at the dinner table doing homework and I remember my mom going off about him and taunting him while still on the phone. They had broken up that night, again, and he still had a bracelet and some perfume at my mother's house that he wanted back so he could pawn it for money for drugs. My mom did not want to let him in this evening for some reason. Looking back, my mom was high out of her mind on drugs, but at the time, I didn't really understand what was going on. At around 9 p.m., I went to take a shower and planned to go to sleep shortly after that because I had school in the morning. It was when I just put the shampoo in my hair that I heard the glass break and my mother scream. We lived on the first floor with our front door at ground level. The front door was mostly glass. Mom's boyfriend had broken the glass and was able to open the door from the inside out. I turned off the shower while rinsing out my hair and started listening. I heard a loud thunk while he hit my mom and she fell down the stairs. Adrenaline started rushing as I quickly realized that this was really bad and I exited the shower. I put on my pajamas and hid behind a small cabinet. I knew that if he found me, he would kill me but I'd still somehow cared about being naked. Teenage brain, I guess. Setting there, I heard how he started to tear down our house. I heard chairs flying, glass breaking, he and my mom screaming, etc. I wasn't sure if he knew that I was home, but I was sure that he'd hurt me if he found me. So I hid and turned off the lights. I didn't know what was happening downstairs, and all I could hear were my mother's screams. I thought he was killing her. Thankfully, he, quote unquote, just beat her up. I tried calling the police on my phone, but somehow it didn't work. I only had internet, but no service. It was really weird, but my phone did that sometimes. I texted my friends in a group app and begged them to call the police. I was completely hysterical, yet somehow I managed to type so fast and without shaking. Luckily, my friend saw my text within a minute and called the police with her dad. I don't really remember that much about the rest of the incident, except the police entering the house and him becoming violent so that they would shoot him. It didn't work. They managed to overpower him and take him to the station. My mom found me curled up with the lights out behind the sink. I was too afraid to come down, because what if he was still there and tried to kill us? The police came and collected me, and I walked downstairs and saw that he had broken everything we owned. 
furniture, my laptop, doors, even the lamps on the ceiling. The whole ordeal took maybe 20 minutes, and he got convicted on home invasion charges and was sentenced to 40 hours of community service. It took me six years of intense therapy to be able to shower again without fear, or to be home alone in general. It's been almost 10 years. My mom has been clean for almost one and a half years. The worst thing, she's still with him. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Have a great night, everyone. And I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.